of paranormal sightings and encounters and what is the cohesive glue of all these UFO dogmen, Bigfoot uh, sightings that if you lay one map of Bigfoot sightings on top of dogman sightings on top of uh, UFO sightings, they all kind of coalesce. Do you, uh, yeah. So can, do you have an opinion on that? Um, well, I, I don't know if it's a firm opinion. I have some ideas, you know. And, of course, I always like to quote um, the late, great John Keel, who invented that term, the, the window, where he feels there are window areas where somebody opened the window and left it open, and then everybody came rushing in. You know, and, and I think he would be um, intending that to be seen as maybe another world or um, a place in another universe, that sort of thing. Kind of the same idea as a portal. And I, I don't know for sure that there are such things, but the other thing that I see when, and I, I always do that comparing things on maps, looking to see what else has been seen around that area, um, is that there seems to be a correlation with anomalous lights, whether they are exactly UFOs or just, um, you know, orb type things or streaks of light or um, what, whatever you, you, can, uh, you can imagine. There does seem to be a correlation with that, where you've got earth lights or UFOs. You almost always have sightings of the Bigfoot or the Dogman or, or some other really weird creature. And even uh, Lee's Field that I was just recently telling you about. Mm -hmm. By the way, that that whole thing is fully, fully explained in um, my most recent book, which was Monsters Among Us, if anybody's interested in that. But um, just a couple of years ago, I was out in the field with, with Lee and another colleague of ours. So there were three of us. Uh, trained trained people used to looking for anomalies, and it was August, and we were sitting out in his um, hay field because he had um, a carcass sitting out that no nothing had touched, which was really weird because usually you'd set something out there and the coyotes would get it, you know, and there'd be prints and you'd see all kinds of things. This one had no action, and it was rotten, but he'd had far more rotten carcasses out there. So we didn't know that that was the answer. And finally I said, well, you know, maybe maybe there's something bigger coming and chasing away the, everybody else and, and the big thing, and we should just sit out there and do a stakeout for one, uh, as long as we can one evening. So that's what they did. They agreed. And uh, we drove a car partway out. And instead of parking over near the tree line where this always happened, we parked across the field. And... Uh, Lee did have a trail cam set up. We all had cameras, too, in our hands. And we were sitting, kind of enjoying the night. It was during the Persid uh, meteor showers like we just had. So it was almost the same exact time of year. Mm -hmm. And watching lights across the field, they looked like they were going over the treetops, but actually they're, they were uh, a little farther away. There was There's a flight pattern that a lot of local aircraft take going right over. And so I was kind of keeping an eye on those, just sort of enjoying. And all of a sudden I realized one of them, did not proceed, it stopped, like in midair. And then it backed up, and then it went forward again. And I'm not talking about little oscillations, I'm talking about really large movement. And I said, I was sitting in the back seat where I like to just, I like to keep an eye out the back window, <laughs> just to make sure we're covered. It's always sneak up on you from behind. Yeah. And um, Lee and and uh, my friend Sanjay Singal, uh, both of whom are over six feet tall. They're, they're big guys. They were sitting in the front seat. I'm in the back. And as soon as I said, guys, I don't think that one is an airplane. They both looked. And when we put our attention on it, full attention from the three of us, and maybe that's the key, maybe that's something it could home in on, it began immediately to proceed straight across the cornfield toward us. It wasn't meandering. It wasn't you know ri rising up from any swamp marsh. Uh, grass in, in the field or anything like that. It was right on its same, it just turned in its flight path and came straight at us. And we were watching it, you know, and in the course of time that it took for it to cross this field, we were all going, what? What is that? And I'm, I'm in the backseat jostling for a better look at it because um, it's aiming toward the front of the car. And it came until it was about, mm, we, we estimated 25 to 30 feet off the ground and about that same amount away from the car. So we're talking close range. This wasn't like something that stayed on the other side of the field and we were worried about it. It was a white, 
sphere that looked like it was about the size of a basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, it was providing its own light, but it wasn't really lighting anything up. There was a um, just slightly discernible kind of royal blue colored tiny light to its left that Lee and I saw it. Um, Sanjay did not, but he has a very different kind of eyeglasses than we do. We speculated maybe you know, it didn't show up on his or something. But anyway, this thing comes and we're staring at it and I'm trying to, re- I'm just raising my camera up to aim it out the window at it. Um, and Sanjay had a sudden inspiration to take this very large mag light type of flashlight that they had in the front seat, aim it out the window and, and flash it at this light. And we all had the sense, we all were watching, of course, paying very close attention. We all had the sense that it kind of just shuddered a little and hesitated and was surprised like we shocked it that we did that. And then it just sort of, um, I don't want to say it popped out, it sort of lightly imploded. I don't know how, we've all tried to describe this and the words just kind of fail us. It just sort of imploded inward on itself and was gone to our vision. I didn't even think at the time, but it may have still been there. It just knew how to turn itself, switch itself off light-wise perhaps, who knows. Mm-hmm. And at that point, the three of us all just yelled our favorite word, whatever that was. <laughs> and we were so shocked. And Lee, who again was the math and physics teacher, just kept saying, "This can't be. That's not in physics. That can't happen. This did, you know, this couldn't have happened in physics." He was having, you know, just a complete shock reaction as we all were. So um, Sanjay said, "Well." I'm going to get out of the car and just see if it went around that bush for some reason. And neither Lee nor I felt like we wanted to join him. So he just got up and did that real quick. He came back in about two seconds and said, I I don't know why I can't explain it, but I'm going to be sick. I can't stay here. And so um, he started up the car. Luckily it started. Often in situations like that, your engine does not start. Mm -hmm. But he did, and we got out of there. But so... What I'm saying, my whole point of this, and and back to your question, is that it just seemed like all of these things, all all the weird lights that that showed up, and there there were other quite marvelous ones that I talked about in in the book too. They just seemed like they had some connection with these creatures, and everything was just you know nicely put there in this one tree area on on Lee's farm, and I found that again and again and again and. In fact, um, Monsters Among Us, one thing that I did in that book was wherever I had a good date on an incident that I could trust, and then I would go to the online UFO postings and solar flares and moon phases and see if there had been reports of any of those. And I did find the strongest correlation I found was to solar flares, believe it or not. Oh, I not to it. full moon. Yeah, not to full moons or anything else, but the solar flares seem to be the best predictor in the, or maybe the best associated phenomena, most often associated phenomena, um, just out of the ones that I did. And, of course, in one book like that, um, it can't be statistically valid, really. But I was just a little more impressed. That I, I was a little impressed that I found more than I thought I would. you know. And it would take somebody undertaking a really big study to, to find all of them. And then, of course, sometimes there's just not enough data to really – do any research on, on the time or place. But um, that that's somehow is what I think ties these things together, the mists, the strange lights, what it, find out what those are, and then you'll probably know what the other things are. Mm. I've got one question about the area that you saw this interesting light. Did you ever go back in the daylight or go back with any kind of monitoring equipment to see if you can capture this thing again? Oh, yeah, yeah. I have a tri-field meter. Um, I, we've been out there many, more, many more times. And um, Lee also has um, several other trail camps. He's put as many as four trail camps out there at a time. Um, whatever we can find, we take cameras, we take pictures of, um, you know, what prints and other things that are out there. Plenty of stuff, but... Um, just haven't had quite that same experience. But he has thousands, literally thousands of photos where his trail cams have been triggered and that show, some show anomalies, um, 
some don't seem to show much, which is another puzzle because you're wondering what possibly triggered that. Right. Um, he's also he's also been chased while in his pickup truck by some sort of large anomalous um, misty cloud, which was a, a weird thing that followed him out onto the road and that uh, he turned right and then it went off somewhere else finally. But it, it wasn't headlights of anything. It wasn't a vehicle, another vehicle. He sent it to some experts and they said the best they could tell it was some sort of heated plasma. But being out in the middle of nowhere, there was no real source for the plasma. So it just, you know, you, you find one label for it and then that sort of falls apart when you examine it in light of where this is happening and look for the other things that should be there. So the this particular property, does it have any kind of, uh, like, crystal phenomenon in, in the soil? Does it have, like, uh, quartz or anything in the stratus? Not that I know of, you know, and I have done a little bit of research on this. You can go to the, um, the uh, U.S. Uh, Geological Survey, which has all kinds of information online about uh, most places in the country, and have looked for correlations. Someone had told me that they thought um, Bray Road had iron under it, but I haven't. Been, I have not been able to yet find any correlation to that. I know there haven't been mines or anything like that. The one very interesting thing that I did find, um, but and this is just by digging into very kind of arcane, very uh, small pub publications of early histories of the area, was that it did at one time serve as a Native American trail between uh, summer lake camps. And it was covered, uh, lined with maple trees, sugar maple trees, which made it probably automatic. I've talked to Native American friends of mine, automatically a sacred site because maple sugar, you know, before before uh, Europeans came, they didn't have the white cane sugar. Mm -hmm. But sugar is a great preservative. It's... it's um, you know, especially maple syrup is, is a great preservative. Um, it's very tasty and um, also has good good carbs. And, and so this was something that was really valuable to them, to have this wonderful resource right there. And it's probable that when they had something considered sacred, they perhaps had a lot of ceremonies that were done there. Um, it's really not unusual for any other thing that I've been able to find. Other than that, it is, it kind of sits at the center of a ring of small lakes that have sacred effigy mounds around them. Mm -hmm. And they form, if you use your imagination a little bit, you don't have to real hard. Um, the end of Bray Road is right at the hub of what looks like kind of a big uh, medicine wheel. You know, a, 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 you imagine all the lakes are forming the the rim of it, and then this point at the end of Bray Road is the hub, and then there are little trails that go off that are now mostly um, highways and byways that we still use, and it forms this sort of medicine wheel. And that may be pure coincidence, um, probably is, but I just thought it was kind of cool. Yes, actually, one of the other things that I failed to mention with the initial question was if you lay, there was a survey back in the 1800s uh, done by the Smithsonian at the, I think the request of the U.S. government, was to categorize and map uh, aboriginal mounds in North America. Mm -hmm. And they correlate with uh, all these paranormal sightings. And I'm, they do. They do. Uh, and you mentioning this uh, medicine wheel of the mounds around the lakes just absolutely just, you know, put a fine point on that one discovery that I actually came across uh, with another fellow that uh, does about the same research that you do. Denver, I don't know if you know Denver Michaels, but uh, he's a friend of mine uh, that I've interviewed. But the big thing is, is uh, the other question I wanted to kind of dovetail into this is, are the ley lines in uh, any correlation with some of your research that you've seen with these specific sightings that you've come across? Or like parallel lines, like the, the 37th parallel that's so big on the UFO sightings? Yeah, I have actually, you know, found some correlations with, uh, par with the parallel lines. Um, with As far as the ley lines go, I, it's kind of hard um, 
to establish exactly where the ley lines are, I think, because, you know, in Europe, you've got all these really ancient known sacred spots and people would make, there would be straight lines between the, the sacred spots and they're easier to, to figure out. And so I've never been really sure exactly where our ley lines would be. But um, in my second book on this topic, after I wrote The Beast of Bay Road, um, and it's still out there, it's called Hunting the American Werewolf, um, I did make a discovery that I was looking at a map, um, a 